Welcome to The Artist Story. I'm Adam Margo. I'm a writer, director, and story artist, and author of Story by Numbers, a deep dive into story structure, character, and theme. My scene structure intensive is coming up on April 13th, which is Saturday. The scene intensive is all about understanding the mechanics of story, looking at character objectives, specific plot points, and building those scenes around specific turns. Now, the spots did sell out actually on the first day. Um, but we have made arrangements to have a couple more spaces that are available. So if you want to jump on the wait list, you can join us at cinematicore.com. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, AI, artificial intelligence. Now, right now, the common slogan that I've been hearing is that AI is not going to take your job, but the person using AI will. I'm not convinced. The truth of it is, is there's a lot of mythology growing up around the concept of AI and artificial intelligence and a large exaggeration of what it's capable of. It's extremely good when it comes to data processing, well, organizing information, categorizing things. It's, it's a kind of algorithm aggregation. The kind of problem solving that I'm seeing when it comes in the creative space is largely still kind of categorization. It, it takes information and puts it into the place that it needs it to be, or that it assumes that it, that you want it to be. So when it comes to things like formatting on a very concrete level, there, there's some practicality. I can see some, some usefulness for it. If it's being used as a creative tool, it keeps on just regurgitating concepts that we've seen labored over and over because it sees it as successful. It, it might be useful for developing the organization of your story, but I, at this point, I'm not convinced that it's a creative tool. I thought what we'd start off doing today is we we're doing a series on page one because page one is your first impression. It's what you're being judged for. Like when somebody opens your script, they look at your page one right away. They are deciding whether you're a good writer or not. Most of the time they're deciding within the first 10 pages, if they're even going to read your entire script, the first page determines whether they're even going to bother taking you seriously as a writer. So first of all, when we look at page one, the elements that we want to convey with our very first first impression is show that we understand the craft, demonstrate that we are thinking cinematically, lure the reader and use spectacle. And then at the very end of the page, we want to give some kind of payoff to indicate that we understand that story is about setup and payoff. That little touch of a, a slight payoff at the end of page one really shows that we know what we're doing and that we're going to keep paying off every single page. The, the principle of entertainment is like a bank. You're taking out a loan. Somebody pays you their attention. Now, when you're writing and they keep paying you attention, they're expecting to be paid back. Every single payoff is that satisfying moment where they, they feel like it has been worth their time and worth the intention that they have lent you. Literally, that's why it's called a payoff, because you're paying off their attention. Uh, investment and attention. So I thought we'd uh, jump into the deep end and see what AI has to offer. I approached this with two different programs. I used uh, chat GPT and used that to generate a few scenes to see how it interacted. And then I found a different uh, screenwriting AI software that I experimented with. And we'll get into that in a little bit. What I wanted to do is see what it was capable of. Uh, if I was to get a script that was produced by AI, I wanted to see how I would respond first as a reader and then how uh, to what level it would be able to collaborate with me as a writer. I'm going to read a few page ones that, um, that I produced on chat GPT because I wanted to see how it handled uh, coming up with dramatic structure and if it understood subtext and a, a lot of the elements that we're concerned with as writers. Uh, so I started off with this prompt. I'm going to go ahead and read it exactly as it, it was, as it was produced. And then we'll talk about this from the perspective of a uh, writing consulting, or we'll talk about this from the perspective of uh, a story development. Okay. So the prompt that I, that I fed it was compose a one page scene in a screenplay format that hooks the re that hooks the reader and makes them want to read more. Okay. So the very, very broad, very general. I just wanted to see what they would, what chat GPT would offer with very limited prompts. Um, I wanted to be as vague as possible just to see what it produced. It's kind of like if you go up to a writer and say, what ideas do you have? Let's, let's begin by reading this, uh, this first page exterior abandoned factory night, the eerie glow of the moon casts long shadows over the crumbling walls of the abandoned factory. We hear the distant howl of a wolf and the rustle of leaves in the wind. 
A car pulls up outside the factory, its headlights cutting through the darkness like searching eyes. Jason, thirties, rugged and determined, steps out of the car, his breath visible in the cold night air. He carries a flashlight in one hand and a worn and a worn map in the other. Jason, under his breath, this is it. He cautiously approaches the entrance of the factory, the sound of his footsteps echoing ominously in the silence. With a deep breath, he pushes open the creaky door and steps inside. Interior, abandoned factory, continuous. The interior of the factory is shrouded in darkness, illuminated only by Jason's flashlight. The air is thick with dust and the scent of decay. Jason's flashlight beam dances across broken machinery and discarded debris as he navigates through the maze-like corridors. Suddenly, he freezes as he hears a faint whisper echoing through the darkness. Whisper. Whispering. Help me. Ellipses. Jason's heart races as he follows the sound of the whisper, his footsteps echoing louder now in his ears. He turns a corner and comes face to face with a startling sight. A woman, twenties, her eyes wide with fear, chained to a wall. Jason, urgent, hold on, I'm getting you out of here. Before he can reach her, a shadowy figure emerges from the darkness, blocking his path. It's impossible to make out the figure's face in the dim light. Figure, mocking, leaving so soon? Jason's grip tightens on his flashlight as he braces himself for whatever lies ahead. Fade out. Okay, what's your impression? When we first glance at this page, we're seeing a few red flags. Um, first of all, brick wall, brick wall, brick wall, brick wall, brick wall. Okay, so the description's pretty dense. Now, the truth of it is, is this isn't, it's not as bad as I was thinking it would be. I mean, it had, like, if this was presented to me, I've, you know, I've been reading a lot of page ones, especially in the last few weeks. And, you know, this isn't the worst of them. So how does it handle the form of screenwriting? So there's, there's actually some decent writing. The eerie glow of the moon casts a long shadow over the crumbling walls of the abandoned factory. Okay, so once you start getting a little heavy with the adjectives, the eerie glow, the crumbling walls of the abandoned factory, that starts to feel kind of heavy and weighted, and your brain starts losing track of, so like, this a factory is abandoned, these walls are crumbling, the glow is eerie. Um, it's kind of a way of like smuggling too much. A lot of people think of this as poetic writing, but what it ends up doing is it crams too many concepts into one sentence and it starts to feel like an avalanche rather than creating mood. What it does is clutter too many images. It's part of the reasons why I advocate having these like kind of short staccato, um, sentence and sentence fragments that convey an image and convey an action in a very clear, specific way. Um, it doesn't waste a lot of time with, um, with description and most of the action, um, like you use the verbs to convey the tone and you trust the audience that they're going to interpret the actions and the context. And that is what builds the tension. You don't use adjectives and adverbs to build the tension. So if we were going to rewrite this abandoned factory night, it's a solid sug line. The moon casts long shadows over an abandoned factory. Okay, now why don't we want headlights cutting through the darkness? The general wisdom is we want to get rid of our ing words. We want our verbs to be um, present and to punch. As soon as you make them like a present participle, a gerund, present progressive, it's kind of like saying, this is going on while this is about to happen, or this is happening. So when you're saying is happening, or is, and then the ing, it comes off as not as passive, as well as um, undermining the intensity, the immediacy of the present tense. So present progressive means this is happening while this is happening. That's why it's present and it's progressing forward. On top of that, gerunds, sleeping, eating, walking, swimming, those tend to undermine the kind of punch and the visual immediacy that we want to convey with a screenplay, which is why generally we want to cut these ing words. So the headlights cut through the darkness. See, it, it, it has that immediate image and it, it feels like we're watching it happen versus headlights cutting through the darkness like searching eyes. Um, I don't really know eyes that are you know, projecting light into the darkness. 
and they don't really cut through the darkness. So just drop all of that headlights cut through the darkness a car pulls up clear, simple, and we're already conveying the image. It's dark. It's night. The moon casts long shadows on the abandoned factory. And then every time you introduce a character, you want that at the very beginning of the line, rugged and determined steps out of his car, his breath visible in the cold night air. Um, I like that actually we could, because this is all established in one shot, we could have that. This is starting to push into the third line. And again, let's keep our, let's keep most of our lines down to one line, maybe two, very rarely three and never four. That's kind of my general rule for uh good screenwriting. That's, that's what keeps it feeling like you're constantly moving forward. It, f it feels like you're just on a water slides flowing through the story. Rugged, visible, under his breath, this is it. Okay. So one of the things that I found when I was finding all the, when I was uh, generating all these AI scripts, for some reason, ChatGPT, every single line of dialogue has this thing right here, this little uh, commentary on in parentheses. These are called Riley's. Now, a Riley is something you almost never want to do. It's, it's, Basically, it's giving direction to the actor. It's telling the actor how to interpret the line. You almost never want to do that. It's also an indication if you have to put too much Riley's, if you have to put too many Riley's in the in dialogue, it means that your dialogue is not conveying the subtext. Um, now, there are very rare times where you specifically want to, um, you, the line of dialogue betrays the intention of the, of the character because they're being ironic or because they're being wry, which is where we get the term Riley. Um, he says it Riley with a wry smile. In other words, what they're saying is uh, they're being sarcastic or ironic. What they're saying is the exact opposite of what they mean. That's when you want to put a parenthetical in there. Um, just in, just, just to make sure that it's completely clear that what the person is saying, they don't actually mean. Um, but that should be very, very rare. An entire feature length script, you maybe have three or four Riley's. Um, and for some reason, chat GPT, um, doesn't trust us to understand the subtext and ends up giving direction. This is, it is a completely non-line, like, especially with an introduction of a character. It, it's, it doesn't convey any new information. It doesn't convey subtext uh, It's chaffa. We just get rid of that. Uh, he cautiously approaches the entrance of the factory, the sound of the footsteps echoing ominously in the silence. Okay. So that's a mouthful cautiously approaches the entrance of the factory. Okay. We're looking at a factory. That's the only entrance we're looking at. So cautiously approaches the entrance the sound of his footsteps echoing ominously in the silence again more chaffa it's more wasted space i like the idea of echoing footsteps ominously in the silence uh, of course it's echoing in the silence it's not echoing across machine rattle with a deep breath he pushes open the creaky door and steps okay so Starting off a sentence, you want to be as sparing as you can. When you start off with a parent, or sorry, when you start off with a preposition, when you're reading along, you want to have a clear, give me a subject, give me an action, tell me exactly what is happening. With screenplays, they don't read like literature. Literature, you have, you know, kind of the four basic structures of sentences and you want to vary between them. Really strong screenwriting you tend to want to be very clear and very specific. You don't want a lot of dangling like prepositions. You want to starting off a sentence with a preposition is saying, I'm about to tell you what you, where you need to look and what you need to pay attention to. Starting off a lot of sentences with prepositions is a sign that you're not thinking cinematically because you're not attaching to an image with a deep breath. He pushes open the creaky door and steps inside. So I think what it's implying here is that he takes a breath pushes open the creaky door and steps inside. So now we can see how it's a little bit smoother. It's a lot less clunky moon casts long shadows over the abandoned factory headlights cut through the darkness car pulls up. Notice we still have the same sense of tension. We still have the same sense of atmosphere. We just got rid of all of that wasted, those adjectives, uh, the adverbs and the unnecessary uh, description and unnecessary action too. rugged and determined. I like that. I like that it's describing an attitude. 
steps out of his car, his breath visible in the cold night air. He carries a flashlight. So just to save space and again for economy, flashlight in one hand, a worn map in the other. That way it really punches. Flashlight in one hand, worn map in the other. Part of the economy is um, limiting. If we don't need a pronoun, don't use it. If we don't even need the verb, a flashlight in one hand, worn map in the other. We already know that that implies that he's carrying. Uh, he cautiously approaches the entrance, takes a breath. Right there, I threw in that pronoun just to um, keep the flow and go. It, we could easily, we could just as easily say cautiously. Cautiously approaches the entrance, takes a breath, pushes open the creaky door, and steps inside. Okay, still same level of tension, a lot more economic, and flows a little easier. Interior abandoned factory continuous. The interior of the factory is shrouded in darkness. Okay, it is shrouded. There's another thing that I saw a lot with, with this style of writing. Um, and yes, ChatGPT absolutely had a very specific style of writing. It, it felt like it was pulling from a lot of almost kind of cliches of screenwriting. Um, like the, the wolf howling in the moonlight, the, the, the first line saying, this is it, where it's like ambiguously pointing at some sort of plot that's supposed to mean something, but doesn't. So the scent of decay, this is uh audio visual experience. So unless Jason's reacting to it, we can't write what something smells like. I mean, you can write it, but it's, it's, it's largely wasted unless you want to indicate that the character is responding to the the must and decay. Dust particles catch the light. Jason's flashlight does a bit of debris. Navigate through maze like corridors. Okay, as. Big thing, as. We always want to make sure that every single shot, every single line conveys one action. As soon as you have a this, as, that, it's not that you can't do it, you just rarely want to do it. Because you're saying like, make sure you're, you're conveying this image as well as this image. Every single shot has one idea, which means one object using one action. As soon as you have as, and that's why we avoid um, like present progressive, because it implies that multiple things are happening at the same time, which is split focus. And it means you're not composing your shot or your scene. Flashlight beam dances across the broken machinery and discarded debris. We want to use his name again, because this is a new scene. Um, sometimes when you're in production, you just print out a scene at a time, uh, and you want to make sure that you're clear on which characters are present in that location. That's why every time you begin a scene after a slug line, you need to say the character's name and introduce the characters that are present. He doesn't have to navigate through. He just navigates the maze, the maze like corridors. Suddenly he freezes. So if he's in a corridor, okay. He freezes as he hears a faint whispering echo through the darkness. Okay, that's literary. It's it, that's that's a line where it's setting up what's about to happen. Instead, all we need he freezes. So there's the action, but he's going to freeze in reaction to hearing a whispering echo through the darkness. Okay, through the darkness. We already know that it's dark. We might want to throw this Liz dark corridor whispering. Okay. So the character is named whisper young woman works here. Jason's heart races as he follows the sound of the whisper, his footsteps echoing louder now in his ear. So echoing louder in his ear, the echoes, they'd be echoing through the corridor because it'd be literally the sound unless they're playing some kind of subjective thing comes face to face with a startling sight. Okay. The audience, the reader is going to decide if it's a startling sight or not. Woman, we're introducing her. So that's all caps. Twenties, her eyes wide with fear. He's going to see. So the way we take in information is we see the large first, and then we take in the details second. So he sees a young woman chained to the wall, her eyes wide with fear. Urgent. Yeah, no shit. Get rid of that Riley. Hold on. That's a period. I'm getting you out of here. That's actually okay. So this, this actually works pretty well. Uh, let's get rid of my prompt. That way we get the full sense of the meaning. Okay. That gives us a little bit more space. 
before he can reach her, before he can reach her, total chaffa, waste of space. A shadowy figure emerges from the darkness. There we go. Let's all caps that. Emerges from the darkness. In final draft, if you just do a, a command K, that'll all, all caps whatever you're highlighting. A shadowy figure emerges from the darkness, blocking his path. It's impossible to make it out of the, fig the figure's face and the dim light. Okay, blocking his path, that's a separate idea. Emerges from the darkness. It is, it's impossible to make out the figure's face in the dim light. I don't know why we want a contraction there. So, so he's silhouetted. Shadowy figure emerges from the darkness. Yeah, Chaffa, waste of space. Blocks Jason's path. Just so we're avoiding the confusion of the pronouns. Like, we don't know if the shadowy figure is male or female. Figure mocking, leaving so soon. Again, that's redundant. We know that, that he's mocking, leaving so soon. It's undercutting the tension of the scene. So that's a little bit of a payoff. That kind of that kind of works. Jason grips Jason's grip tightens on his flashlight as he braces himself for whatever lies ahead. Total chaffa. Waste of space. And then fade out. Fade outs for the end of the script. If you have the entire feature, the end, or fade out. You don't want to um, usually indicate a transition of fade out at the end of a single scene. Okay, so this actually, okay, so this is a scene, it works. There's uh, a character is at an interesting environment. There's tension. He's looking for something. He has an objective. The subtext is very thin here. Structurally, it works. There's And there's even a little bit of a payoff. He found some girl there chained. There's something creepy happening. This is disturbing. So it's not the worst, considering the fact that this was like a completely like just open prompt. Uh, just do give me something that's interesting. Uh, it definitely paid off in that sense. Um, as far as like the actual writing and thinking cinematically. So this isn't something, you know, you, you couldn't just hand off a prompt or hand off a script idea to the AI and have it, you know, churn out a script that's, that's workable. You'd have to have a lot of experienced writers who know what they're doing or experienced filmmakers who know what they're doing. If they took this script, they would have to interpret a lot. This is, um, I wouldn't say this is a, a well-written script, but it, it has some potential to it. Like if you wanted to use it as kind of a tool for developing some ideas. So what's interesting is I started adding, I started doing a few different prompts where I would um, start to get a little more specific, add in a few adjectives like a crime thriller or a tense, a murder mystery where they find a body or something like that, using kind of different tropes to see how it handled. One thing I noticed is that anytime there was like tension or thriller, every single time the first thing it did was it said it interior abandoned warehouse or abandoned factory night consistently. Like I think I did five different prompts without any indication that I wanted to be in a warehouse and it always said abandoned warehouse night or abandoned factory night. So, um, apparently chat GPT thinks, uh, abandoned factories are very scary places. I think it was Gene Hackman said, if I open up a script and on the first page, it says interior warehouse, uh, he closes the script and throws away. It's one of the signs that, you know, there are plenty of great stories that take place in warehouses, but most of the time it's such a generic trope that it kind of turns into, well, the, you know, this is, it, it's an indication that the writer is not thinking creatively and this is just going to be one generic story after another. So after that, uh, you know, what, what's interesting was it didn't do a terrible job at kind of building some atmosphere. In fact, it probably laid the atmosphere on a little heavy, but I wanted to see how it handled some character interactions and how it, uh, if it was able to, to manage to convey some sub subtext or something. So I gave a prompt where I said, can you do a comedy? And the first thing it did was produce a, a bookstore cafe and then another bookstore cafe and then books. So apparently warehouse bookstore cafe is something that's very, uh, it, it tends to kind of resort to a lot of the same generic tropes, which is part of the concern about the AI is that artificial intelligence tends to be regurgitating. It just keeps repeating what you feed into it. So because of that, it's, you know, the part of, part of the ability of creativity is to look for new ways into something. And a lot of what it's trying to do is, is give you what it wants based on 
past uh, satisfaction or past uh, approval. So it's, it's binary and it builds that kind of binary aggregation of ideas to, to where it's like, okay, this is what seems to be working over and over. And that's why you train the model to respond to you. It generated a few different like com comedy scenes, but I wanted to see what it would do if, if like how it would handle characters and subtext and if it was able to kind of uh, make it more adult um, because it was very kind of the characters were kind of speaking like 13 year old kids. Uh, so this one, I, I gave the prompt of uh, of an adult comedy um, and I wanted to see how it handled the interaction between two different characters. So let's read this one real quick. Interior, swanky nightclub night. The pulsating beat of electronic music fills the air as the swanky nightclub teams with a diverse crowd of glamorous partygoers. The dance floor is a kaleidoscope of flashing lights and gyrating bodies. At the bar sits Jackson, nearly 30s, a suave, confident man with a devilish grin. He casually sips on a martini as he surveys the room with a twinkle in his eye. Suddenly, a stunning woman, Sophia, late twenties, slides onto the bar stool beside him. She exudes an air of mystery and sophistication, her eyes sparkling with intrigue. Sophia, seductively, mind if I join you? Jackson raises an eyebrow, a smirk playing on his lips. Jackson, leaning in, depends. Are you here to buy me a drink or steal my secrets? Sophia laughs, a sultry sound that sends shivers down. Sophia laughs, a sultry sound that sends shivers down Jackson's spine. Man, that's hard to read. Sophia laughs, a sultry sound that sends shivers down Jackson's spine. Fucking Dr. Seuss. Sophia, leaning closer. Maybe a bit of both. Their playful banter is interrupted by the arrival of the bartender. Forties. A grizzled man with a, no, with a no-nonsense demeanor. Bartender, flashing a grin. What can I get you two tonight? Jackson gestures to Sophia with a charming smile. Jackson points to Sophia, whatever the lady's having, and make it a double. Sophia raises an eyebrow, impressed by Jackson's confidence. Sophia, smirking. Bold move. As the bartender prepares their drinks, Sophia leans in closer to Jackson, her voice dropping to a seductive whisper. Sophia, teasingly teasingly. So what's a charming man like you doing in a place like this? Jackson leans back, his gaze locking with Sophia as he delivers his response with a smirk. Jackson raising his glass, just looking for a little trouble. And I have a feeling I've found it. Their eyes lock on a sizzling moment of mutual attraction, setting the stage for a night of passion and intrigue. Fade out. Okay. <laughs> as soon as we see this, of course, seductively, we're seeing Riley. Every single line of dialogue has a Riley leaning closer. At least this Riley was not. It's describing an action. Sometimes uh, it calls for that. So that's not terrible, but it doesn't need it. L like let the, let the actor find the truth. Like maybe they wouldn't lean in. Maybe they pull back and that's their way of flirting. Flashing a grin again, let the actor find that. Uh, points to Sophia, whatever the lady's having, of course. Uh, yeah, Th this is this is what you call over directing, smirking. It's it's a big reason why actors have actors and directors have a lot of disdain for Riley's because they're they're just they're trying too hard to to control uh, the performance. Uh, now notice. Uh, just thinking cinematically, um, every single script that it generated, it always started off with what you would describe as kind of a wide shot. So it's, it conveys the whole image and then it cuts straight to the main character. Um, and that's what it did consistently. Wide shot, main character, wide shot, main character, wide shot, main character. Pulsating beat of electronic music fills the air as a swanky nightclub teams with a diverse crowd of glamorous partygoers. That's a fucking mouthful. The dance floor is a kaleidoscope of flashing lights and gyrating bodies. That actually conveys the image even better. We just had one little, it's like, give me something cinematic. And by cinematic, I mean that you're, you're taking advantage of the medium 
to get us to wonder what's going to happen next. We get to play with it a little bit. One of the things that, that I'm seeing in the way the, the, the writing style that Chat ChatGPT is using is that it just gives you the image. It just tells you this is what's happening. It's all expositional. There's no leading. There's no playing with like, ooh, is this going to happen? Where is this going to go? Um, now, this is where we need to talk about we need, we need to step away from just effective writing and talk about story structure. Um, we have a man who's at a bar who's looking for some sort of intimate connection. Basically he's sitting there and a beautiful woman slides up next to him. So he has a clear objective and then a woman comes up and gives him exactly what he wants. The biggest thing is this, the structure doesn't really convey any conflict whatsoever. And this is a problem we, I started to notice with every single story is that there was never any conflict, uh, that it, almost every single scene was about presenting the characters and, um, you never had a sense of you. So you sometimes had a sense of that the character wanted something, but you never had any actual direct conflict. And conflict again is about a character who, you know, this is the, uh, Sorkin's altar, uh, he worships at the altar of intention and obstacle. Um, and a lot of these stories didn't really have any kind of obstacle, or even if they did have obstacle, we didn't see them na navigating the obstacle through different tactics. Now, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in my scene structure intensive is how we use tactics and the tactics convey the problem solving that the characters use based on their value system. And that the intention is the subtext of the scene. Now the subtext of this scene is you have a man who wants to hook up with a woman and you have a woman who wants to hook up with the man. They both want the same thing. There's really no negotiating there at all. And they end up getting exactly what they want. So there's no conflict here at all. When it comes to understanding basic scene structure, you always want to have, uh, first of all, some, some obstacle. And then you, the thing that, it, the reason why we watch stories is because we want to see how people navigate obstacles. We want to see them fail. We want to see them succeed. And we want to see them go through different tactics. Some that we've thought of, some that we haven't thought of as part of the, the, the reason why we're so interested in stories. We want to see how other people navigate the world around us. We want to experiment with their value systems and see what value systems, what consequences and what advantages their value systems give us. And what we're seeing here, we're not really seeing much conflict. Now, to be fair, my prompts were very vague and very general, but it kind of comes down to what the function of AI, what can AI give us as writers? And at best I see what it's giving us is kind of these, it's providing just kind of a general processing of data. It, it organizes things into a place that they could be, but, but I'm not seeing much of an advantage here. I know that there are a lot of executives out there that they think of writers as just story machines, just do what I tell you, make the story work. Um, and as a professional, your job is to make their story work for them. And it's not always easy, but the really good execs that have an appreciation for what writers can do and that understand and respect art and story know that it's a lot more than just plugging in a few prompts and then have the machine pump out what you need it to. At this point, I know that artificial intelligence is growing quickly. I think there's a lot of mythology of what it's capable of right now. And most of what it's doing is kind of um, facilitating assets, which means it's, it's, it's creating tools that we can use that our reach is a little bit further, but it's still De highly dependent on what we feed into it. Okay. So after I worked with the uh, chat GPT, I was looking up different uh, screenwriting software that people are developing with AI. Um, and I came across this one called plot dot dot AI. That's plot dot dot AI. I uh, spell out the first dot, the second dot you use the dot. Um, and th this software has some potential. Uh, I was, I was impressed with some of the development tools that it has. Um, but I, what, it, what it's really good at is kind of prompting, uh, ways to organize your story structure so that it, that it has like a coherent structure. Um, but so what, what I did was I, I did kind of a test where it, if I did just minimal prompts, what would the program come up with? 
Um, and it, you know, asked for genre, it asked for just general premises, asked for themes. And I, I came up with something. I think I fed it the, the, the title potential title was blacklight and I want to do something kind of sci-fi and something about some dystopian story. I thought that would be kind of a fun way of like, uh, diving into it. So I just gave very minimal prompts just to see what the, um, what the software would produce. Um, and this is what, what it does is it takes you through the entire process of developing the script in three different acts. And then each act has three different sequences. Uh, and from there it generates a scene, um, with the overall, with the overall prompting and the overall structure, I think it, it worked as kind of a way of, of beginning to organize your ideas. It's kind of like putting up post-its and you can expand it as much as you want. So with this experiment, I just wanted to give the minimal amount of prompts just to see what the software offered. Um, and this is what it came up with. It was largely about a man trying to save a general store. Um, and I think when I typed in the name blacklight for the title, it interpreted that as making the main character, his name is black. Uh, so I was a little confused by that, but, but, uh, so keep that in mind when I'm, when I'm reading the script and let's, let's read, uh, I actually need to read a couple pages just to get an idea, a feel for it because these, these, uh, scenes actually ended up being pretty sparse. Uh, so this is, uh, page one and you can see first impression, very sparse interior blacks, general store day black stands behind the counter arranging merchandise he looks up and smiles as the bell over the door jingles and two customers enter black morning folks beautiful day out there the customers murmur hello black cheerfully asks about their families and work while they browse the shelves the customers respond politely but with little enthusiasm customer one times are tough for everyone just trying to get by each day Black smile fades slightly, but he nods in understanding. Black. I hear ya. Well, let me know if you need any help finding anything. The customers continue browsing while Black tidies up behind the counter. He glances hopefully anytime someone lingers over an item, but no one brings anything to purchase. After several minutes, the customers leave without buying anything. Black's shoulders slump as the door shuts behind them. He takes a deep breath and returns to arranging the merchandise, preparing for the next customers. Okay, so that's the page one that the uh, script produced. And then I wanted to read you page two. Page two, it recommended that he went to the bank to try and get a loan. Probably not the best... Uh, Financial strategy. Um, interior loan officer, loan officer's office day. Black T enters looking worried. He removes his hat and takes a seat across from the loan officer. Forties humorless. Thank you for seeing me, sir. As I explained, my family has run the general store in this town for over 20 years now. It's been our livelihood. My father's before me and now mine. The loan officer nods politely. Black. But since the stock market crashed, business has been slow. We've had trouble paying suppliers and making rent. If I could just get a small loan to cover expenses for a few months, I know I can turn things around. The store is so important to our community. Folks rely on us. Black leans forward, pleading urgently. The loan officer remains stone-faced. Black continued, voice cracking. I'm sorry for getting emotional, sir. It's just, the store means everything to me. It's been in my family for generation. If I lost it now, after so many years, I just don't know what I would do. My father would be so disappointed. Black takes a deep breath, blinking back tears. The loan officer checks his watch. Loan officer. I understand this is difficult, Mr. T. <laughs> Mr. T. I understand this is difficult, Mr. T, but my decision will be will depend solely on the store's financial standing and your ability to repay the loan. Why don't you let me review your statements and then we'll discuss? The loan officer opens a folder on his desk and starts looking from the looking through the paperwork. His expression neutral. Black watches anxiously. Now I know this is more about the page one. You got a good sense of the page one, but I also wanted to show how it handled different scenes with different levels of character interaction. Let's uh, let's throw this in a uh, final draft just to see how it formats. So when when we throw it into final draft, it formats a little bit cleaner. Um. Yeah, this format just doesn't, just doesn't cut it. This isn't even proper formatting. You'll notice something in the three different scenes that we reviewed is that 
each one of them were expositional. They did convey a sense of intention. They, like the main character is primarily struggling with keeping the store open. We did get a sense of that um, kind of heavy handedly. Um, there was the, the biggest thing is we didn't have any conflict. Um, we didn't have any, um, I guess you could say that the obstacle is that he's not selling anything. Um, but we didn't see him taking any other tactics to try and sell somebody on something other than just being kind and standoffish. Um, and then the biggest thing is there's no subtext. Uh, all the subtext is on the surface. Uh, the, everybody is saying exactly what they think, exactly what they feel. Now it's, it's especially true when we go to the loan officer, mm-hmm. everybody's saying exactly what they think. Now uh, subtext has, uh, is basically the intentions and it conveys what we want, but it conveys what we want through coded metaphors. And this is something I talk a lot about and I'll be going into in depth with my uh, scene structure intensive. We're going to talk about how we use subtext. First, we identify the plot, the objectives and the intentions, and then, um, mine the scene for metaphors that offer the subtext. And the subtext is usually how we communicate with each other, which is by, um, usually we're trying to hide our intentions so that we protect ourselves. It's part of the, uh, of culture. We negotiate different ways of getting what we want without fully disclosing exactly what we want. I feel like we could go back through the pages, but honestly, we're just laboring a lot of things that we know aren't quite working. Now, to be fair, this plot dot dot AI is, I think it's a useful tool when it comes to like organizing your ideas, but it still leans heavily on the writer coming up with these, the conflict, um, the story structure. The thing that I come back to is this isn't offering anything that the author doesn't already need to know. The writer already needs to understand story structure, needs to understand conflict, needs to under sub, understand subtext. Uh, and then on top of that, the formatting, uh, the formatting needs some work. My favorite thing about it was the interface where it's, it asked for prompts to start to develop the story and the scenes and the sequences, and then it kind of locks them in. And once you lock it in, then it produces these, uh, script pages. It's called scriptification is what they're calling it. I like that. And to be fair, I'm, I'm, I didn't offer much prompts. I let the AI do most of the work just to see what it could handle. And the truth of it is, is there was no conflict. There was no subtext. Everything was on the surface. This isn't just plot.ai. I also saw this with chat GPT. Pretty much all of the AI was producing stuff that was pulling on and referencing and regurgitating um, sources from pre-existing scripts. And a lot of it had, uh, it, it was pulling from the surface. Um, and it wasn't engaging the essence of story. Story is about using a plot, using an objective. And a plot is different than a story. A plot is a dimension to a story. The plot is what the characters want. The plot is directly connected to a problem they want to solve. And every tactic they use reveals character. Character is the different dimensions of value systems that determine how they solve problems. And then subtext is part of the way we navigate and negotiate uh, solving those problems, the the different tactics we use. And that that requires a certain level of instinct, uh, maturity, and uh, ultimately human experience. And it's that human experience that allows us to work on that abstract level. I'm not seeing anything that's being produced by AI that could be really even much of a tool. I know that there's a strong incentive to want to use AI in production and in in, uh, creation. I'm not very impressed with it as a creative tool. Perhaps there could be some strengths when it comes to um, exploring different ideas, brainstorming. Basically, AI at this point doesn't quite have the depth and uh, level of abstract thinking or awareness of human experience and intuition to be able to convey a compelling story. I've yet to see anything that that could convey that. I'm not saying it's pos- it's not possible. I do think it's very possible. I think very quickly, probably within the next five years, it's going to be reading our brains and anticipating exactly what we want and what we will find emotionally engaging. But at the core of it, it's not tapping into our emotional values and speaking to us. Like story is ultimately a vehicle for engaging and exploring different values. 
the profane and the sacred and the, the relationship between those. And it does that by using problem solving. Um, every single plot is about solving a problem. The, the, the way they solve the problem express values, which expresses what is meaningful to them, the problems they choose to solve and how they solve it. So I do think that there's some potential here with AI at this moment to develop ideas, but it's almost kind of like a sounding board, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, you know, I often sit with friends and brainstorm lots of ideas, bounce ideas off of them. And then we develop those ideas together through back and forth. Um, with a little bit of our, uh, a little bit of practice with some artificial intelligence and some training of the models might be able to do that. But what, uh, what I keep seeing is a bit of kind of regurgitation. It's largely self-referential. It's referential to already existing kind of tropes and, uh, stereotypes rather than actually engaging what is emotionally meaning for it. I didn't see anything that really hooked me, um, if these were submissions by um, clients, I would say that they were just beginning their writing journey um, and that they, they need quite a work in understanding format, story development, and character development. A lot of what's missing is this idea of, of the relationship between plot, character, subtext, and how all of that is embodied in conflict. And that's what I'm not seeing here at all. Like most of artificial intelligence, this is an aggregated algorithm, which means it's good at processing information. At best, it can help you develop assets, but ultimately in the end, the story, the creativity, all the choices still completely rely in the hands of a storyteller, of someone with vision. This is still the process. At best, it's a kind of a sounding board for the writer to develop something. My biggest concern is that people are going to see this, uh, and AI, they're going to start seeing AI as kind of an authority on these things. And, uh, they'll, they'll see these recommendations and they'll, it's, it's very difficult to, to do good screenwriting. It, I've seen great writers struggle to convey a really good scene and find the conflict. And my concern is that people are looking at, uh, these AI tools and thinking, oh, this, this conveys the story. It gets it across when these aren't compelling stories, this isn't a human condition at this point, creativity is still 100% in hands in the hands of the artist. But even still, you know, you saw the scripts, you saw the, you saw the pages, they still needed quite a bit of work. These were not even ready for even a first draft. Artificial intelligence is here to stay just like computers, just like electricity. Uh, but the thing that is, is we need to think of these things as tools. Uh, we need to develop our own disciplines, our own abilities. Uh, writing, painting, uh, art, sculpting, isn't going anywhere. The important thing is that we develop these story abilities, these, this sensibility, we use our instincts. The reason we engage stories because we want to engage the world around us. As soon as we let computers and machines do the thinking for us, we cease to find meaning. And that's why we have stories because we're looking for meaning. The people that are thinking that it's a, a, a shortcut or a quick answer to finding meaningful stories, um, I think they're barking up the wrong tree. I think what we need to do as storytellers and artists is keep delving inside and developing those instincts. Uh, anything that AI produces, especially creative, the audience is going to have to respond to it and experience it. Right now, it's kind of at that, at that level of spectacle, uh, much like when film was first released. People would go watch these trains going by and people walking out of a factory. And it was just a spectacle. It was interesting to see, but it didn't offer necessarily meaning. And story, the reason we engage story is we're searching for meaning and values. And that's why at the core of that, as storytellers, we need to keep searching for value in ourselves. Thanks for watching the art of story. I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know what you guys think. Are you going to, are you going to use artificial intelligence in your production or are you completely against artificial intelligence? I really want to know what you guys think. Thanks for watching and have a great week.
You've got a story inside you. A screenplay no one has ever thought of. A novel you've been rolling around inside your coconut for years. Maybe you wrote a few pages and stalled out. Maybe you even wrote a whole draft but don't feel confident it's any good. Or maybe you've been writing draft after draft after draft and slamming into writer's blocks or dead ends or wandering into the weeds. Maybe you just have a few scenes centered around some dope high concept but you don't know how to develop a character. Much less construct a plot that would generate a character arc. Maybe all you have is some simmering spark of an idea. Just a simple desire to write a story. This book is for you. Story by Numbers is a step-by-step -step process. It gives you the tools to construct a plot that fleshes out your story with characters so real, so compelling, so multi-dimensional, you begin to wonder if you're possessed. Story by Numbers is composed of three parts. Part 1 gives you an overview of the 4-act structure, 24 plot points, 8 sequences. Part 2 is a 35-question examination of your story that will guide you through developing and outlining your novel or screenplay into the 4-act template. Part 3, well, that's just next level dope shit. This isn't just another book on theory. Story by Numbers is a diagnostic toolkit for developing and fine-tuning your story. You'll also want to pick up the Story by Numbers workbook. For each story you're writing, you'll need a journal to organize your ideas. The Story by Numbers workbook is a companion notebook that walks you through the process as you outline your story and guide you through each phase of development. From constructing your protagonist's internal drive, to plotting conflicts that expose character, to composing scenes that drive compelling stories. By the time you've completed your story by number and workbook, you'll be ready to finish your manuscript. Whenever you ask a writer what it takes to write a good story, they usually say there are no rules. If you want to know what they really think, ask them about a novel or movie they hate. Immediately they'll unload a litany of do's and don'ts so specific, so precise you'd think they're citing commandments. We all know following a formula is what turns stories into zombified, hacky imitations of better stories. You don't want a formula. You want a process. A method composed of practical principles that breathe life into your concept. You don't want some bullshit magical key. You just want to know what works and what doesn't. Does your story resonate or not? Everyone knows there are no rules for writing a great story. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, here are the rules. Story by numbers. Write more, better, faster, doper.